We've come to part three of a five-part lesson. In the first lesson of a series of 13 Bible classes divided into 13 sections, and this lesson is on the introduction and theme of the book of Romans. We introduced uh, by giving various facts about the book of Romans, to whom it was written, from whom it was written, the Apostle Paul, to the saints in Rome, and that it was probably written in Corinth on his third missionary journey. We gave the outline of the book and the lessons that we will be covering, the Lord willing. And we also looked at the salutation, the beginning of the book, the first seven verses, which Paul begins the book with. Now we have come to Romans 1 and verse 8, continuing this lesson, uh, looking at what Paul said, hoping to get closer at, and, if possible, to the theme of the book, the main idea in this third part. And so now we begin, and we have been teaching these lessons with the church, meeting in Hendersonville, Tennessee, the Lakeview Church of Christ, on at 132 New Shackle Island Road, for uh, right off of Gallatin Road, uh, for anyone who may be in this area. And we have been teaching them also online with the Central Brooklyn Church of Christ meeting at 15-10 Avenue H near the Avenue H stop of the Q train uh, or the B-168 bus, uh, Coney Island Avenue bus a few blocks uh, from there. And so uh, we are teaching these lessons and now presenting them online uh, at BibleSearch.com and the Bible Search YouTube channel so that all may benefit from these lessons. Let's look now at Romans 1 and verse 8 beginning. Paul thanks God and prayed for the Roman Christians. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayer always in my prayers making request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you. And so what Paul is saying is he has a great desire to, to be personally with the Roman Christians. He knows of their faith. It has been proclaimed far and wide. And if the Lord wills, uh, he will seek to come uh, to be with the Christians in Rome. And it reminds us that whatever we plan to do in this life, we ought to plan in harmony with the Word of God and praying to God that we may have life to carry out uh, what we are planning to do, not acting as if we have control over our own lives and circumstances. In James chapter 4 and verse 13, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the, 
to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it. To him it is sin. So we do not boastfully plan. We humbly and prayerfully plan by the will of God in harmony with his word and praying that we might have life that only God gives and by his providence that we might be able to carry out those things. Paul did come to Rome by the will of God but in a different way than he had planned after many trials and several imprisonments and, and almost and being shipwrecked in the sea, the Mediterranean, he eventually came to Rome after several years, but he would come as a prisoner who had appealed to Caesar after the Jews had continually tried to take his life. Romans 28 and verse 16, when we entered Rome... Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldiers who were guarding him. Verse 19, But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation, uh, uh, not, not that I had any accusation against my nation. Verse 20, for this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I am wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. And he's talking to his fellow Jews now in Rome as a prisoner, seeking to preach the gospel to them in that situation. Verse 30 and 31 and he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness unhindered. And so Paul, uh, for two years, would be in Rome, but he would be in Rome as a prisoner. Although God would bring him there, it would not be in the exact way that it might have been thought. Paul desired and planned to visit Rome. Verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you. Each of, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. And so Paul is planning to impart some spiritual gift to the Romans. Verse 13, I do not want you to be un unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So Paul gives at least two reasons why he desired to come to the brethren in Rome. First, that he may impart some spiritual gift to them, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And second, that he might bear fruit by bringing those uh, to obedience of the gospel who, who are lost among those in Rome and encouraging the brethren that they might be edified and more fruitful in the faith. What spiritual gift was it that Paul sought to impart to the Romans? Well, the apostles had the power given to them by the Holy Spirit that they could lay their hands upon individuals and transfer miraculous gifts to them of, of various uh, uh, types such as speaking in tongues, foreign languages that they had not learned but were spoken by others, such as prophesying, uh, 
teaching the Word of God by the guidance of the Holy Spirit including uh, revealing things that would take place ahead of time and and other uh, gifts uh, that were involved and so they had the with the help of God that ability how do we know that is the case Acts 8 and verse 14 now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is, they had been baptized for the forgiveness of sins, but they were not able to perform any miraculous gifts by the Holy Spirit, had any miraculous powers by the Holy Spirit. Acts 8 and verse 17, then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, Simon, the one who had been baptized earlier in the chapter, a magician, saw that this was truly power from God that was uh, real and not uh, fake. He wanted this power, going back to thinking in his old way of life, that he might make money on it by uh, selling it to others, saying... Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. And so Simon had turned to covetousness, and Peter said, You are uh, condemned because you have sought to buy this power with money. And so it is clear that the transfer, now later on, as we'll read later in this lesson, Simon prayed and repented and turned from this covetousness, but the main point of the passage that we just read is to show that we uh, that the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to perform certain uh, ways, uh, miraculous uh, abilities, uh, was in the hands of the apostles, including F of Peter and John and also Paul. And so probably that's what he had in mind when he said to impart some spiritual gift, impart some gift to you. But then we go on, and Paul said he was a debtor to preach the gospel even to all who were in Rome, uh, verse and beyond Rome. Verse 14 and 15 of Romans 1, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are at who are in Rome. Paul said because of the obligation that had been laid on him by the Lord to go preach to to all people especially the Gentiles that he was a debtor to bring forth the gospel to all. And we are in the same way, indirectly, our debtors to God to bring forth the gospel to all as we have opportunity and ability because Jesus' great commission that we read about after he was raised from the dead has been passed to all of us, that responsibility. Matthew 28 and verse 18, And Jesus, after he was raised, came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so we have that obligation uh, to teach others, baptizing them for the, for, for the forgiveness of sins based upon their faith in Jesus, their repenting of their sins and confessing that faith before men. We baptize them, making disciples of them at that point of baptism for the forgiveness of sins to begin that new life in Christ. Jesus said in Mark 16 and verse 15, and he said to them, go, to, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Shall be condemned, he who has disbelieved. And then in Luke uh, so here we see in Mark, Jesus said, he who, has, he who has believed and is baptized shall be saved because that faith must lead one to be immersed in water in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. And so being saved by the sinner's prayer is not in the word of God. It is faith that meets the conditions that God has given through Jesus and the apostles to obey the gospel. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 46 and 47, Jesus said this after he was raised from the dead. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And so that is the idea that we are to repent of our sins along with believing and confessing Jesus as the Son of God and being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins in order to become a child of God. And this is what we are to teach others uh, th that have become Christians that they are to do to go out and reach the lost that they may be saved. And this is what we are to do. Uh, have that obligation that we are indebted to go out and find those and bring them to Christ by the gospel. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 1, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these uh, to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ, of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. But the idea, teach others also who are faithful men, that they will be able to communicate to others the gospel to be saved. And even if we can't communicate to others clearly, we can invite those to be taught by those who can communicate, either privately or in the assemblies of a local church, who will teach them the gospel in the way that the scriptures have revealed. We are to live in such a way that our teaching will be uh, believable to those that we try to teach. And so we try, by the will of God, to live according to what we are taught to be a Christian in this world, that we might have a moral influence, that it will not detract from the gospel, but will bring people to the gospel. 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, But you are a chosen race, 
spiritually speaking, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that is a, the Christians throughout the world, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you, want, for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they, they slander you as evildoers, they may because of your good deeds as they observe them Glorify God in the day of visitation. And so that is the type of way that we are to live in the gospel and to humbly answer those uh, who call upon us to defend uh, the truth. 1 Peter 3, verse 14, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation, and do not be uh, troubled, but sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. And so we are to do that uh, day by day, live the Christian life and take advantage of opportunities that others will see that life that we're living is different, that they will want to know the gospel possibly how to be saved why are we a living we are living that way and maybe they will be called as some of us have from darkness into light to be saved now and look forward to eternal life now we have come in the last part of our lesson to that great theme of the book of Romans the main idea the gospel is the power of God for salvation to all who believe, whether they are Jew or Gentile, uh, non-Jew, whoever they are, they must be saved by the gospel and the gospel only. Romans 1 and verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And to the Jew first, because the Jews had a background of Old Testament Scripture, and they, they are the ones who might have the possibility of understanding things more quickly if their minds would be open uh, to the gospel. And so what we have is the gospel, the good news about the kingdom of God and salvation through Christ. That is what the gospel is about. It is the account of the good news that God is saving us through Jesus. It is the power, it is the strength, the ability, the word from which we get dynamite. That is the power of God for salvation, deliverance from the guilt of sin and God's wrath against sin that is to come. The gospel is God's only power to save. That is God's dynamite, that word uh, that is similar to where we get our word dynamite from, an Anglo anglicization, anglicizing of that Greek word for power. That is God's ability and strength to save those from sin. Uh, is what it is about. 
It is the power also to transform our character so that we might become more like Jesus after once receiving the forgiveness of our sins that we might daily apply those things that are revealed in the New Testament that we might be changed over a period of time to become like Jesus. To all who believe, to the Jew first and then to all the people because the Jew had the Jews have the background of the Old Testament in which the Christ was revealed that he would come and suffer and die for our sins, be buried and be raised from the dead, and ascend into heaven to the right hand of God where he is now ruling as king and priest, all of that foretold in the Old Testament. The gospel is God's power to save and to transform us it is the power that reaches to the innermost thinking, desires, and intentions of our heart. Hebrews 4.12 and 13, For the word of God, uh, 4.12, Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And when it was preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when Peter said that Jesus had performed these miracles, and that it was confirmed that he was the Son of God by God raising him from the dead on the third day that had been prophesied by David in the 16th Psalm and that he ascended into heaven to be king and priest as prophesied in the 110th Psalm and fulfilling the 132nd Psalm, the oath that God swore to David that he would set one upon his throne forever. Then he declared in Acts 2 and verse 36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, that is, anointed one, this Jesus, whom you crucified. And when they heard that, in verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? What are we going to do to get right with God? Is there anything that we can do? Here Peter did not say pray the sinner's prayer and everybody who tells us that is deceiving us. They are lying to us whether they mean to lie to us or not. No one became a Christian by the sinner's prayer but through faith, repentance and when we read about in Acts chapter 8 at the last part of the chapter, uh, through confessing him as the Son of God. Then in verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized, immersed in water, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, that salvation that God has brought to you. And so through repentance... Upon believing in Jesus, repenting of sins, confessing him as the Son of God, as the Ethiopian eunuch did in Acts chapter 8, verse 35 through the end of the chapter, and through baptism for forgiveness of sins, trusting in God through the blood of Jesus to cleanse us, they became Christians. That is how we become a child of God, not in any other way. And upon becoming a child of God, as we learn and apply the gospel, the apostles' teaching to our daily lives, we become like Jesus. Romans 8, 29, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And in Romans chapter 8 
uh, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, which we'll go into great detail uh, later as we go through these lessons. Romans 12 and verse 1, Therefore I urge you, he writes to the Roman Christians, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And when the mind is renewed, it comes in contact with the Word of God. And day by day, as we learn the will of God, we grow in the grace and knowledge of God, and as we apply it, we become more like Jesus, made into a different character, a different form. This takes place over a lifetime. It is not an instantaneous uh, situation that so many people teach wrongly, again, in the denominational world, where the Holy Spirit miraculously changes us into the image of Jesus and after that, we can never fall after being saved. That is not the case. It is a continually, continual applying of the word, putting off the old, putting on the new, uh, uh, that we may become like him, as we read about in Ephesians 4. We'll get to that in some more lessons, as the Lord wills. But then this power to transform us Ephesians 3 and verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man through the gospel so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And so we are to continue in God's power to transform, applying the gospel daily to our lives, the apostles' teaching in the New Testament. He will change us day by day, working far greater power than we could ever ask or think. And so we pray to be changed. We seek to study and apply and practice the word of God to be changed. And that word... God will work it that we may be changed day by day far beyond what we could imagine. But we often fall short of the will of God as Simon, the one who coveted the power of the Holy Spirit, did. Acts chapter 8 and verse 18, And now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money as we had read previously. Then we read a little further. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Then he goes on to say in verse 22, Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that if possible the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. And so that is what Simon was called upon to do. 
And that is what we are to do. If we are going to continue to be transformed by the gospel as Christians who were once baptized for the forgiveness of sins, we are to repent and pray, confessing our sins to God, that the blood of Jesus will cleanse us, that we might grow in that grace and knowledge and go forward, uh, that we might one day inherit eternal life. We're going to close the lesson now, but you see the theme. The gospel is God's power to save both Jews and Gentiles. It is his only power to save. And it's the, it, it is so critical that we understand the truth about the gospel and that a good and honest heart will humble themselves before God and will turn to those things before it is ever too late. We would encourage you to do that now. If you believe in Jesus as the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess him as the Son of God before men, and as soon as possible, immediately if possible, upon your confession, be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that you might be saved today. Have God forgiving you by his grace, through his blood, through Christ's blood, all of your past sins, and begin to walk in newness of life, abiding in the apostles' teaching only, that you may be changed day by day into the image of his Son, and put away those old habits, replace them with righteous habits, that God may be glorified and honored. And those Christians, as we fall into sin, like Simon, let us repent and pray to God, confessing our sins, that we might be cleansed of our sins through his blood, through Jesus' blood, that we might grow in his grace and knowledge day by day. If anyone is subject to that wonderful gospel invitation, we would encourage you to respond at any time. You may hear this lesson as now today we draw our Bible class to a close.